Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. This show will include another in our series of Nobel Prize winners, but we're going to begin and end tonight with actors from the British Commonwealth who, if you're from America, you may never have heard of, but they were profoundly influential in American culture. We're going to start out with Warren Mitchell, who died recently at the age of 89. Warren Mitchell was a nice Jewish boy from North London, and he became one of the most popular television stars in Great Britain for his role on an iconic television series from 1965 to 1975, Till Death Us Do Part. The show was a comedy about a cockney bigot, his somewhat scatterbrained wife, his daughter, and his overly liberal son. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should, because it was the model for America's All in the Family. And on the show, Warren Mitchell played the legendary character Alf Garnett. He was the cockney bigot who made racist and off-color remarks about everybody and everything. Races, religions, government, whatever. And of course, Norman Lear used Alf Garnett as his model for Carol O'Connor's Archie Bunker. Warren Mitchell's Alf Garnett was a little more hard-edged and less sympathetic than Carol O'Connor's Archie Bunker, but his character played quite well in Britain. And like Archie Bunker, Alf Garnett became a household name. Here's a little bit of Warren Mitchell as Alf Garnett in Till Death Us Do Part, railing on about the National Health Service, which was sort of a sacred cow in Great Britain. Where's your welfare state, eh? That's what I'm on about. Where do they vanish to when you need them? Oh, yeah. You, you're paying for it, didn't you? You have to. See, I was against that from the beginning, you know that. I would have sooner gone private. But no, you ain't got no beaten choice. You have to pay into that. Oh, they said we've got a free health service for you, Mr. Garn. It's only going to cost you X pounds per week. What's X? What's X? <laughs> I'll tell you what bloody X is. X bloody expensive. That's why X is. That's why your free health service is X bloody expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Quick enough when, when you're paying in for it, and I Quick enough grabbing the money off you then. But the minute it comes a time to give some of it back, they're not so bloody quick or keen then, are they? I'll tell you, if it was one of your city companies, one of your private firms, one of your insurance friendlies done that, done a bunk with the money, one you, what you've paid in, they'd soon get their collar felt. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> they ain't soon. Their bloody feet wouldn't touch the ground. The bloody fraud's got to be onto them. But just because it's a government, that can rob you blind, they can. Well, they give me this chair. Oh, yeah, they give me that chair. They give you a bloody wheelchair. <laughs> I never give a no one to push it, did I? Another interesting note, Arthur Miller saw Warren Mitchell in Death of a Salesman and said he was the best Willie Loman he ever saw. We're going to move on now to Mal Whitfield, who died recently at the age of 91. Amazing story. Nice African-American boy from Texas who moved to Watts when he was little. He was one of the last remaining Tuskegee Airmen, and we did the story of the Tuskegee Airmen when we did the Lowell Stewart podcast. So Mal Whitfield ran bomber runs over Europe in World War II and over Korea in the Korean War. But he was also one of the world's top middle distance runners from 1948 to 1954. He ran track at Ohio State, same school as one of his mentors, Jesse Owens. He won two gold medals in the 1948 Olympics, along with a bronze and a silver in 1952. His specialty was the 800 meters, and he broke the world record in the 1948 Olympics with a time of 1.49.2. Here's a remarkable stat for you. In that six-year period from 48 to 54, he ran the 800 competitively 69 times and won 66 of them. And the U.S. team used him on the 1,600-meter relay, where he won a gold in 48 and a silver in 52. In 1954, he became the first African-American athlete to win the Sullivan Award, the best amateur athlete in America. He later went on to train some of the great runners in the world, especially in Africa, where he moved for a while, including Kipchoge Kano, the first great African Olympian. And here's your male Whitfield trivia. He is the father of CNN anchor Freder Weeker Whitfield. Here's a brief clip from the historic 1948 Olympics in London, the first ones after World War II mentioning male Whitfield. Wembley Stadium, England, scene of the 1948 Olympics. This was the first Olympiad to be held since World War II, and the last before the Soviets entered the games with their state-supported athletes. And the last time America led the field with bona fide amateur athletic power alone. In the grueling 800 meters, watch as America's Mal Whitfield opens up and burns his way into the lead. Stunned with stars, the record of the American Olympic team of 1948 stands high among the sports milestones of the century. We're going to move on now to our feature tonight, Douglas North, who died recently at the age of 95 in our series of Nobel Prize winners. 
He was a co-winner of the 1993 Nobel Prize in Economics along with Robert Fogel. They won the award for, quote, having renewed research in economic history by applying economic theory and quantitative methods in order to explain economic and institutional change, unquote. But what that really was was they studied economic history and placed the value of institutions on an equal level with the value of markets in determining which countries were successful and which weren't. Dr. North was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He went to school at Berkeley, but he did most of his important economic work at Washington and St. Louis. Here he explains what his work was about and what his interests were. I was an economist. I still am an economist, but economic theory is one, static, it's timeless, it assumes perfect knowledge, perfect information on the part of all the players. While it's very useful, and I, I don't in saying, say it uh, being useful for economic analysis in a moment of time, it's not very useful for an economic historian to try to deal with what happened over 10,000 years of time, but, uh, you, but anyway, over time. That's how I eventually came to institutional economics. Institutions were all about how you structure society, both at a moment of time and over time, to deal with the problems you face. New institutional economics begins with cognitive science and goes all the way on up to the way in which we organize society. So you begin with cognitive science, how the mind and brain work, and how we get the beliefs we have, and how that the beliefs uh, shape the way we see the world and deal with it. And so I've spent my life trying to figure out what institutions are, how they work, and how they should work. And particularly how they should work, because one of the things that is a problem with economics is that it's not only static, but it assumes that everybody knows everything. And of course, if that was so, uh, the world is easy. Hear from a Nobel Prize interview. Yeah. Why do some countries become rich and others remain poor? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. I think that's very important because the fumbling and bumbling we do around the world to trying to improve lots, have traditionally not had much help. In fact, the World Bank that I've been an advisor to did a survey of the first hundred billion they'd spent trying to improve things, and they came to the conclusion they hadn't had any effect. Maybe a slight exaggeration, but I think that's probably true. You have to have imaginative and creative people. How to get people to be imaginative and creative is something that and we have clues about, but we don't really know how to do it. It's a complex thing what makes for economic development, economic growth. We know some things. We certainly know that education, improving a lot of varieties of things, morality and so on, are important. But how we put them all together and can do it ahead of time, and when people take credit for the fact that a country's with, I think they're uh, full of baloney. One of the things that uh, makes me mad about economists in the world is that economists uh, think that the world works automatically with just knowledge and information is all you have. But creating an incentive structure that works, that produce, makes people do things, is enormously complex. So when I first became interested in institutions, it seemed to me that was the key to what made them work. And then you had to figure out what made institutions effective. And I've spent much of the last 30 years trying to figure out how to make institutions more effective and how to direct them to uh, do things that would improve society. And I think we still have a long ways to go. But... Institutions are the key to understanding how to structure human interrelationships in ways that will make it so it will work better or worse for that matter. Economics is a theory of choice. That's what economics is all about. And so it's at the core, really, of what we think we're doing. To give you a good answer to that, you've got to go back to something we know still much too little about, which is how the mind and brain interpret from the senses, eyes, ears, nose, and feelings, how those stimuli go to your brain and how your brain then structures them to make sense out of them. That's a $64 question because if we knew, now we have some clues about it, and indeed cognitive science is all about that. And I've spent a lot of the last 15 years trying to understand cognitive science and working as an amateur with people who are neurologists. We're a long ways from understanding it. Clearly, it's at the very heart of what we need to understand if we understand how we make the world work and how to get to make it work better. Dr. North had some interesting thoughts on teaching. Your best way to learn is to have to learn for yourself. One of the things that I've had to learn as a professor is that you're not really educating students by preaching at them. You're educating students by making them think of the problems themselves and coming up with thoughtful answers for themselves after you've provided a framework 
and understanding that will allow them to do that. And I think an enormous amount of education, particularly higher education, is misdirected just because we preach at them. He had some interesting thoughts on the Internet. People have a chance to evolve more rapidly in a world where you have low-cost information. It's a negative in the sense that they get all kinds of other influences, some of which may be deleterious, including becoming bandits and outlaws and what are very common today. And I'm not too optimistic when I see what's happening today that the influence of rapid change like that is all good. And some final thoughts on our future. What do you think is humanity's uh, greatest challenge? Surviving. I think that one of the things that we are not understanding enough about is that we've evolved so rapidly with enormous productive potential and potential for destroying people that I'm not sure we're catching keeping up with it. I think that's scary. I think that the world we've developed now is one that is a frightening world. We're going to close tonight with Saeed Jaffrey, who died recently at the age of 86. Nice Indian boy, born in Punjab. Saeed Jaffrey was one of the great Indian actors of our generation. Very, very well known in South Asia and in Britain. Not that well known in the United States, but he did have one legendary role that if you haven't seen, you should see. He played the Gurkha soldier Billy Fish in the 1975 John Huston classic, The Man Who Would Be King opposite Sean Connery and Michael Caine. He was absolutely superb in that movie, which is based on a Rudyard Kipling story. The word is that while John Huston and Sean Connery and Michael Caine all got chairs to sit on on the set, he had to sit on a stool until Michael Caine intervened for him. Here he is as Billy Fish as Sean Connery and Michael Caine plot to take over the kingdom of Kafir Stein. So this is kind of me, Bill. Sikandar of God, come here long ago from the West. Yeah, that'll be the Greek bloke Brother Kipling told us about. Alexander. Alexander. Sikandar. Alexander. He builded a great city, Sikandar Gul, high mountains, sit on throne. All peoples worship him. Then one day time comes, he say he must go to east. People pull their hairs out, tear clothes. So Sikandar promised to send back a son. 328 BC, the Sarcopedia said. Soldiers saw arrow going to Danny's chest, him pluck it out and not bleeding. So, so, son of Sikandar. Do you think I'm a god? <laughs> <laughs> a god. Put your foot out that I may kiss your big time. You may kiss my royal arms. Not royal. Holy. What a deity, remember? Fiji. Yes, Billy. He's daddy. Not son of Sikandar. No, Billy, he's a man like you and me. He can break wind at both ends simultaneous, which I'm willing to bet is more than any god can do. But the arrow. The arrow stuck in the bandolier. There was no miracle, Billy. So you better tell him that out there. And my dad's name was Herbert Drabbit, Esquire. And he was bar steward in a knocking shop in Durham. Hang on a minute, Danny. Maybe we're missing a bet here. What do you mean? Supposing you was an ignorant kafiri, Who would you rather follow, a god or a man? Now, we're here to conquer this country, haven't we? With you as a god, it would take half the time and half the trouble. The idea is a bit blasphemous like. No, Danny. Blaspheming is when you take his name in vain. God Almighty's. What if they found out we was having them on? Why should they? We won't tell them. And you won't tell them, will you, Billy? Oh, no. Indeed, by Jove, no. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. Let's just say it doesn't work out for the boys as they planned in that movie. And in the penultimate scene, Sonny Jeffrey, Michael Caine, and Sean Connery must confront the angry Kafiris. As a good and loyal Gurkha, Sonny Jeffrey does not run away. He confronts them to face certain death. Michael Caine and Sean Connery are captured and they're about to be executed. And in defiance, they sing a great old Irish tune called The Minstrel Boy. As a final tribute to Sonny Jeffrey... I'm going to play the best version of that, done by the great Irish tenor John McCormick, who we used once before in the Frank Buckles podcast. Hey, fish! Now the mule are right! There's a chance you'll make it! Good car, foot soldier, not cavalry. A rifleman which hated Bahadur Guru. Wishing you many good lucks. Hello, good